and then I'll let Scott open it up quickly for us. All right, well, hello and welcome everybody. My name is Scott Florence. I am the executive director of the Sudbury Workers Education and Advocacy Center. And um, with me is my colleague, our communications director, T.T. Uh, Scott. Mm -hmm. And uh, what the Sudbury Workers Education and Advocacy Center does is we are a small nonprofit made up of uh, workers, students, and community volunteers who are dedicated to improving the lives and working conditions of people in low-waged and precarious employment. We do that by providing public legal information on your rights at work, like we're doing here this evening. Uh, we, You can also just contact us directly if you've got questions. You don't have to wait for us to put out a presentation, you can just get in touch with us. And we also support clients who are having issues in the workplace. Perhaps you have been terminated inappropriately. Perhaps you're experiencing uh, some uh, violence or harassment in the workplace. Perhaps you are uh, have questions or are having your schedule um, changed a lot. We can help support you and let you know what legal recourse you may have for the problems that you're having. We also bring workers together to learn and share from each other. So we uh, have our injured workers group that meets on a monthly basis. We do our action uh, workers action group, which meets on a monthly basis. And we have a youth committee and a justice for workers committee as well. And if you are interested in learning more about any of those contact TT at the end of the workshop. We will happily share with uh, more about that. And then finally, what we do is we advocate to make things better for everybody because um, the Employment Standards Act, the Occupational Health and Safety Act uh, have certain protections for workers, but we don't think they always go far enough. So for example, we'd like to see better protection for workers around paid sick days. We'd like to see paid sick days put in there on a permanent basis and not just the three temporary paid sick days that we have during the COVID period. Uh, we'd like to see better rules around scheduling so that workers can't have their schedules changed at the very last minute and a host of other things. So if you'd like to learn more about the work that we do in that area, again, get in touch after this workshop is over. Uh, so that's who we are. And now I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge where we are. So uh, those of us who are living, working and playing here in Sudbury, we are in uh, at, uh, Anishinaabe territory. And this is the traditional territory, shared territories of the Atikamishing Anishinaabe and the Wanapate First Nations. It is also Robinson Huron Treaty area, uh, this land. Uh, and it, uh, the name for the land is Anishwakamak for the area that we live in here. Uh, there's also Métis people that have made contributions to the area in which we are living, working and playing. And of course, all sorts of uh, people from across Turtle Island now live, work and call Sudbury home. And it's important to me this evening to make this land acknowledgement uh, because you know we've just seen a whole lot of protest in uh, Ottawa, which is also Anishinaabe territory. Um, uh, and a lot of that was around rights, a lot of that was around freedoms. Now, without getting into anything that people wanted, uh, might feel about uh, the reasons for the convoy and the blockade, the police reaction to that convoy and that blockade was much, much different than it was for the kinds of actions that we've seen in the past. So we can contrast that with what's going on in wet Wet'suwet'en territory right now. We can contrast that with what happened at the rail blockades not so very, very long ago. Um, and so there's still a very marked difference in the ways in which uh, our security forces, the police forces interact with those who are undertaking quote unquote peaceful um, blockades. And so I just want to acknowledge that, you know, a lot of people commented on that this, this disparity in the police reaction and, and that's a lived reality for far too many people in our in our world. So in that spirit, I make the land acknowledgement. I'm now going to pass things over to T.T. Uh, Scott, who is going to steer us through most of this evening's presentation on uh, the work that we did in learning about racism in the workplace in Sudbury and the anti-racism work that we are starting to do and will continue to do. So without further ado, take it away, Titi. Thank you. 
So um, I guess this is getting into a little bit why, deeper why into why we're here. I'm gonna drop some links into the group chat while we go along just for everybody um, centered and focused onto what we're going through. But to start off, why we're here is last year, we did a research or we kind of research in the greater Sudbury region. And we asked workers about their experience with racism in the workplace. Um, we did an analysis and we found that 38%, so nearly 40% of workers agreed to still finding that they face some form of racism in their workplace. Um, this was alarming to us. So we, we had the initial survey and we handed out to 121 or 200 plus um, people. We got back 121 respondents and then we did over 20 one on one personal interviews. So we got, you know, personal people, um, individual people to actually give us their inputs, give us what they experienced, give us actual, you know, examples of things that they have been said to us. And some of the things were extremely alarming, extremely hurtful. Um, so we wanted to create this presentation to really start to um, focus on what we can do for workers and to um, give them the proper rights and information that they need. Um, a lot of the information that we were told that nearly 80% of the respondents said that they identified individual or interpersonal racism as being their biggest factor or something that they face at work, which is uh, largely related to microaggressions. These are the day-to-day, -day, daily, subconscious um, racist remarks or comments that we might, that people might make or we might face and they don't even realize. Um, nearly 20% of the respondents said that they actually face some systemic or institutional type of racism. This is that racism that might happen on a larger scale that might be ingrained into our organizations and to in the in the way that we work and how we do things um, that systemically needs to be addressed. We also found out that 50% um, of the respondents said that they were fully aware of their rights, which was great to hear, but not a lot of these respondents must be reporting them because we do see a underrepresentation of um, actual workers who are going through with these claims, going through these complaints and actually being able to fight them. So we wanted to make sure we give the proper information on what this process might look like, um, other information that might be related to it. So this is just why we're here so that we can give that proper information only for 4%. Um, 41% said that they were somewhat aware of their rights. Um, nearly 10% of them said that they were completely unaware. And then also 14% of the people are not satisfied with their workplaces. So that leaves us to say that there can be more done in the workplaces. There can be more information given to workers. And you know there are some more things that we could do. Um, so this is not just for workers, this is for organizations, um, employers to take that initiative and to make sure that their workplaces are um, doing the best on the policies so they can provide for workers and making sure that their rights are properly protected. So that brings us to our first or biggest question. Um, I'm also gonna drop in the group chat, just a little link on where you can stay updated on some of our past studies here. So you might ask yourself how, how workers' rights protected at work, um, especially concerning racist, um, racism in the workplace and racial discrimination. Workers' rights are protected around the Ministry of Labor um, with the Ontario Health and Safety Act and then Ontario Human Rights Tribunal or the Ontario Human Rights Commission Board. Um, the Ontario Safety Act pretty much puts out the workplace harassment policy and general information to protect workers in the workplace that um, sets out uh, complete processes for essentially workplace violence and harassment. Um, and then when you're dealing with rights or rights that are related to the human rights grounds, they are going to be dealt with on the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal or Ontario Human Rights Council. Um, federally, workers' rights are, predict are protected differently. So workers who work at banks or um, pilots, um, postal servicer, um, these kind of workers who work for the government are going to be protected differently. Um, there are other acts such as the Ontario Public Service um, Act, which is focused on public service workers. Um, they have an anti program, which measures targets and indicates, and it works essentially similar to 
different policies that work to protect workers, making sure that their complaints are being taken seriously, making sure that the investigative process is happening and making sure that um, managers are, that they're being satisfied with the results that they're getting and that their um, the voices are being heard and validated. Um, so just to start out here for, for the Ontario, for the Occupational Health and um, Safety Act, sorry, um, essentially what does it do? It sets out the, the rights and duties for all in the workplace and establishes the procedures for dealing with workplace hazards, violence, and harassment. And then the act also protects most of Ontario workers. It sets out the three rights for um, Ontario workers in the workplace, which is your right to know. Um, this is no information, instructions, policies, um, training on different um, um, workplace procedures. And then your right to participate. This means ask questions, get involved in health and safety committees. Um, take action on workplace rights and you know, make change in the workplace. And then you also have the right to refuse, which means you have the right to refuse on face unsafe work. You have the right to um, submit com complaints if, if you have the experience of violence and harassment in the workplace. Um, these are all things that are within your response within your rights as a worker and also will outline some of the responsibilities of your employer whose job is to make sure that you have freedom from violence and harassment in the work workplace and safety from um, certain uh, different threats in the workplace. It's important for us just before we get too deep into OSHA that we express the fact that you cannot get in trouble for asking for your rights under the MRL. So this, if you go ahead and you end up talking to your employer, talking to your management system, um, about what is going on, about taking action on your rights, about, you know, any kind of questions that you have, you should not be experiencing reprisal. This may look like anything like um, cutting your hours short, um, uh, changing its attitude, um, changing your scheduling, maybe a change in your promotion, change in how, where you're positioned at work, anything like this can look like reprisal. Um, and it can, of course, result from anything from you just ask about your rights, from you request things, things we take more seriously, um, constantly reporting something that's not being taken seriously, and you find out that instead of doing something, you're experiencing that your hours are being cut. This is all illegal. Um, we encourage you to reach out to us or reach out to the Ministry of Labor or, of course, 211. Um, definitely talk to somebody and make sure you're documenting this information. We'll get into a little bit more of what that process might look like later. But of course, if you're experiencing reprisal, then just make sure you reach out so that way we can get you the right um, supports that you might need. So going off of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, um, it first sets out violence and harassment policies in the workplace and standards. So all, work, all workplaces are required to have policies and procedures and they must be reviewed annually. Um, policies must be posted in the workplace with six or more employees, and they should include how workers can report concerns, complaints, threats, or other incidents to their supervisors and how the investigation situation would be dealt with. These are the minimum standards that employers um, should be taking on to protect their workers. But of course, workers or employers need to be going above and beyond. Um, Ontario, on, sorry, there are certain examples of human rights or violence and harassment policy, sorry. I'll go to one next year. It essentially lines out who, what, when, where, why, and how, and if there are any witnesses that were there, um, if you have any documentation or um, different kind of evidence of what happened. These are, this is a general outline of what your violence and harassment policy procedure or complaint um, Uh, sorry, policy might look like in your workplace. These should be available and um, open to you. You should be you should be made known where this is, or you should be um, had you should be given easy access to them. So that way, if you need to fill one out and privately um, give one to your employer, fill one out and give one to HR, whoever it needs to be, you can do so without facing reprisal and without fearing um, for your job or fearing about who might see it or who might know about it. Um, we encourage you to, if you have to go through this process, then you know, get those witnesses, making sure you're documenting things, um, making sure you're taking note of what's going on in the workplace. But um, 
course, we're going to get a little bit more into that later. Um, one of the first steps before we're filling out any kind of policies or any kind of complaints, um, although it might be easy to simply when you're experiencing violence and harassment in the workplace or any kind of uncomfortable situation that you might want to just essentially make a complaint and um, go right ahead to your management, which is if you're experiencing something that's making you uncomfortable, definitely go right ahead. But there are other ways in which we can deal with this. Um, we know that workplaces are social places that um, discrimination and harassment may unconsciously present itself, especially with racial discrimination and harassment when individuals may be unaware of the things that they're saying, especially through microaggressions, um, as we were saying that happen on a daily day basis. And the majority of workers were saying that they were facing this. Um, this kind of situation can contribute to a poisoned work environment, which we're going to talk about a little bit more later, <clears throat> and how violence and harassment in itself can um, correlate to a poisoned work environment that might not essentially be targeted or pinpointed um, at you, but can create a very uncomfortable workplace to be in. Um, as a first step, employees should ask the, per the perpetrator to stop and try to resolve the matter respectfully and professionally. So, you know, if you're if you're dealing with some kind of uncomfortable situations in the workplace, it's always good to just reach out, let your management know, and say, hey, you know, if there if there are photos going around that was a joke, or if there are memes going around, or, um, videos, if there's essentially jokes or whatever it is that um, reach a topic that made you uncomfortable that was setting a very toxic vibe in the workplace. Let the people know that want to let your coworkers know privately. Let your management know um, and reach out to um, see if that dealt problem can be dealt with internally and privately before you may have to escalate this matter. Because if there are already if there are is already a strong anti-racist policy in place in that workplace, it shouldn't be hard for them to easily pinpoint where they went wrong and to turn back around and fix that, make the proper adjustments. You know, um, making sure that you are feeling safe, making sure that you're feeling welcomed and, um, you know, invited in the workplace to um, participate and interact freely. Um, and we're in a space that is free from discrimination, harassment and violence and bullying. Um, so this is similar for issues with coworkers. Um, anybody in the workplace, this can happen with, um, a violence and harassment can happen anywhere and at any time in the workplace. Um, this can be threatening behavior, physical attacks, verbal or written threats, verbal abuse. Um, it can be more extreme to the lesser extremes. And these can have effects on you, on the, uh, the victim, of course, the business itself, and then the, rest of the workplace, these things like policy changes, um, individuals, attitude changes, certain things like that. So first step is to always start documenting these situations. If you're experiencing uncomfortable situation, violence and harassment in the workplace that is not exactly targeted or um, creates that toxic um, work environment situation. Um, definitely document, um, try to solve it internally first before you go to that, um, before you try to step and file a claim. Um, a lot of the times filing claim can be an incredible workload or it can be a long process for workers. It can feel like so, but um, before you go through that, there can always be a step where the management can step in and um, try and do better for you and your team. And then of course there is an investigation process that should be gone through. Um, if you go through, sorry, um, before we fast forward there, I did skip a little part where if you are in a union, then your process might have to be dealt with a lot differently. You would go through a grievance process. So speak to your um, union rep. If you are experiencing violence and harassment in the workplace, um, that is your first step. Of course, there are different ways that you can deal with that privately, but your first initial step is to speak to your union rep and go through that process. But then the investigation process after you would file your Violence and harassment claims should look the same. Um, investigations should be completed. Um, no one should be involved in no one involved in the incident should be involved with the investigation. Um, of course, action 
taken demanding all the results. And then if you feel that your case has not been handled appropriately by your internal parties, you know, it's important to contact us or um, reach an appeal to see what you can do to um, make sure that you are feeling safe and welcome in the workplace or safe and um, okay with the results of the matter. Um, after and the complaint is made, an investigation should be undertaken promptly. It should be objective, confidential, and thorough. The person conducting the investigation must not be involved, but they can be internal. Um, so they can be involved in the health and safety committees in the workplace or other areas like that. They may be a supervisor that is in the workplace, but they just might not be, might, they cannot be involved directly in the incident. Um, once the investigation is complete, the parties must be notified of the results and then corrective action is taken and is depending on the severity, it can look like many different things, maybe accommodations or it can be training, can even be dismissal, um, but it may, must not be repressed must not be in the form of a reprisal for the victim. Um, that is essentially the most important thing. If you're experiencing a reprisal, it's important to reach out and to take note, make sure you're documenting and um, being aware of what's going on. I'm just going to take a little break for one second. And well, TT is just getting a drink of water to Arch your throat there. Um, I'll just let you know that we uh, will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. You are welcome if uh, you want to make sure that you remember your question. If you are hearing something, you have a question, you can type it right into the chat and we'll take note of that. And we'll ask TT all those questions at the end of the presentation. We do ask, however, that if you do write something into the chat, that you keep it general. We don't want you to provide any confidential information. So please don't name your workplace or any colleagues that you might be um, asking questions about. Uh, just try and phrase things in a, in a general way. If you do want to get uh, more specific information about um, what you are, uh, what's going on in your workplace, you can give us a call. We'll be posting, uh, we posted our numbers already in the chat and we'll post them again. I should also stress that we, uh, tonight's presentation and just in general, what we do is we provide legal information. We do not provide legal advice. Um, so uh, we provide legal information. And when workers come to us with situations in their workplace, we provide them with legal information that they need to be able to address that situation. We can also support you and provide you with some assistance if you're going to resolve the problem on your own through a Ministry of Labor claim, like TT has talked about a little bit already. Uh, and we can also connect you with a free consultation to legal um, services so that you can find out if you might need or benefit from legal representation for a more complex case. Uh, and it looks like TT might be ready to take back over again. So our commercial break is now over. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was amazing. Perfect. Um, and that brings us into our next connection, which is the end of the um, Occupational Health and Safety Act, and then going into human rights, which is a little bit more focused on addressing racial discrimination in the workplace and what to do if you're exp experiencing um, racism in the workplace. So the Occupational Health and Safety Act covers violence and harassment in the workplace until it becomes a human rights issue, which means that one employee could be bullying multiple other employees regardless of their sex, religion, ethnicity, etc. Um, this is generally not a human rights issue, but an occupational health and safety issue. So if you're experiencing that, um, that toxic work environment, that feelings of um, that may not be racially motivated or that may just be that it's a um, you're experiencing that violence and harassment and you um, want to make that, comp that complaint or you submitted those complaints and they're not taken seriously or you experience reprisal, um, this is where the Occupational Health and Safety Act is going to step in. Um, of course, if there is a racial element to that or el um, element to that, then it is going to be addressed from the Occup Ontario Human Rights um, Council Commission. Um, it only becomes a human rights issue if an employee is bullying other employees based on human rights ground, which is um, sex, gender, religion, ethnicity, et cetera. And you know that these can be an intersection of um, experiences that relate to racism as well. So to talk a bit about human rights, um, it, we have to actually go a little bit back in time because human rights starts out way before, well, if anything, the Racial Discrimination Act actually starts a little bit before the Human Rights Code and designed 
that the Human Rights Code is born out of the Racial Discrimination Act. Um, the Racial Discrimination Act was actually born in 1944, and every person in Ontario has a right to be free from racial discrimination and harassment is the preamble and preface or the general premise of it. Um, Human Rights Code is born in 1962, and it reflects the thinking of the time, but it essentially is born out of the Racial Discrimination Act. Um, in 1982, the code was changed to also tackle systemic racism and discrimination. Um, essentially, it really started to focus on the five social areas, which we're going to get into um, a little bit later, but employment, housing, um, uh, contracts, goods and services, and membership units, and so on, which we will focus some more on later. But the code states that it's public policy in Ontario to recognize the inherent dignity and worth of every person and to provide, the, um, to provide for equal rights and opportunities without discrimination. Um, provisions of the code were aimed at creating a climate of understanding and multiple respect for the dignity and worth of each person so that each person feels a part of the um, community and feels to be able to contribute to the community that they're in. And it also evolved in part from the Ontario Racial Discrimination Act 44 and continues to evolve since then. Um, we're going to quickly just to go over the fundamental rights and freedom that everyone has as a human being, which are you know, they are universal, they belong and apply to everybody, they're inalienable, they cannot be taken away, and they're indivisible and interdependent, and they apply together and are equal, one cannot pick and choose. We're going to get into a little bit more about how this um, really falls into competing human rights and to the intersectionality of where the protection of the code will come into fight, especially if you're experiencing an intersection of violations. Um, as it relate to but not just racial discrimination, but an, ex um, an added amount of discriminations onto that. So, the Human Rights Code protects uh, five social areas and then 17 grounds. This is incredibly important when we're talking about racism and other characteristics and virtues and intersectionality. Every person has a right to equal treatment in the provisions of services, facilities, occupation of um, accommodation, contracts, and employment. Um, racial discrimination can be impacted by, by related human rights codes, such as color, ethnic origin, place of origin, ancestry, and creed. Since race is a social contract, the ground of race can also include related grounds and any other characteristic, oh, my goodness, sorry. Any other characteristic um, that is racialized as a means to discriminate. So for example, uh, many times, um, if somebody is saying that they cannot communicate and they're unable to, um, you're unable to understand them properly, maybe especially the reason for termination or you're not reason or reasons for you not wanting to hire them or their accent is too thick, but this can also be a form of racial discrimination because you're, that person may come from a racially ethnic background. Um, the same thing applies in a situation in which um, black people may be more prone to face discrimination if they are a disability or older um, females and so on and so on. If they are transgender and black, you might face another um, form of discrimination and that are layered on and create to their um, experience and then their added um, experience of discrimination. We're gonna talk about how this is addressed in the code and how they uh, try to accommodate and how to really address this form of systemic racism that is institutionally built into our, our organizations and into many of our workplaces. Um, the code tries to tackle and target these areas of personality and um, I'd say discrimination where it's 
double layered by offering special um, programs and so on that we're going to talk about more later. But to finish off what the Ontario Human Rights Code protects under is that it's a, it is meant to um, rem remedy the situation. So a systemic remedy is a remedy designed to correct the discrimination, which the complainant is found to have suffered. And it's ideally meant to prevent further recurrence of discrimination, both in the workplace and as the, um, for the individuals who have perpetrated it themselves. Um, it can include requirements that the respondent carry out certain acts in order to impress upon the respondent the importance of compliance. So it essentially pushes the importance of um, making sure that whatever the remedy is, that the, that the person follows through and that they're actually taking it seriously and going forward with it. So um, there might be extra pressure from the Ontario Human Rights Council that they're doing that and that they're, you know, there's eyes on them. It's essentially meant to remedy the situation for the person or group discriminated against. And it's not going to be a criminal penalty. It's not actually going to punish any organization or any individual, but it does call for them to take accountability for action and to you know, um, create some sort of um, remedy in which the individual who was who faced that discrimination is validated and they feel that they can move on and they feel um, compensated, essentially. And then to continue on, the Ontario Human Rights Commission um, or the human rights system, pretty much how it would be handled and how situations are addressed. They start out from the Ontario Human Rights Commission, which develops policies, procedures, and um, pretty much the code and how tells us how to understand and how to interpret different policies that are presented. It sets out the different policies for workplaces and um, guidelines in which we, we should interpret for ourselves and for workplaces. Um, and then the Human Rights Legal Support Center provides legal um, support. This is where you can file an application um, or present your information to the tribunal. But the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal is essentially where that, that official um, decision is going to be made. That's where your application is going to be filed. Um, and that is where all evidence is considered a final uh, investigation or sorry I guess final um, choice has happened um, when you submit there. Um, you do have a choice to, to appeal if you're not um, happy with the decision made which you can go forward with. You can also choose to go privately. Uh, the, the choice is up to you but there are again if you do choose to go legal ways there are legal, pen there are legal penal fees that you will have to afford and you know, you might get more money, but it's essentially how it goes through. Um, we're going to get a little bit more into the processes of a human rights complaint claim later and how long you have for that and what that might look like. So to take a little focus now and to really identify racism and how the Ontario Human Rights Council presses out racism, it first um, identifies race as a social contract. The notion of a race comes into existence to support, we know this it supports the, um, this Europeanized um, concept of colonization. And we, um, we also, we know it's a social contract with that, that still has real consequences for individuals, although it's, um, largely historically based on biological accounts and pseudoscientific um, evidence where it is today has led us to many real negative situations such as racialization process in which individuals are you know pointed out or grouped together and um, uh, personified by their um, sorry, identified by the personification, by the character traits, um, they are then, this can lead to stereotyping, this can lead to many different things, and essentially the idea of racism, um, which is the abuse of 
power and privilege based on an ideology of superiority, inferiority, inferiority um, between a dominant race or a non-dominant marginalized group. Um, and it creates binary opposites or oppositions between the two. Um, the idea of one being greater than the other, racism occurs when distinctions based on a person's perceived race are used to disadvantage or negatively impact those individuals. So it's important to understand the actual act of racism and the um, intent of racism um, of, to understand how it works. So not only just the backing behind it where you see the focus and you see the power dynamics that are present between when you have an ideology of race of what race is, but also the effects in which a person acts on it and how racism occurs in which somebody is disadvantaged and how it happens both systemically and um, on an individual scale. We're gonna go into that, how it can be, how stereotyping can lead to more engraved generalizations. Um, stereotyping in itself is the intent and the generalizations of the applied of racialized group. Um, so these are many different things we have. Um, there are many different examples. Um, I'm not going to give any, but there are many different stereotypical examples for that hinder um, hinder individuals from being able to, you know, get those promotions, get those same opportunities made for other people. Um, and then the act of discrimination is the actual act that happens. So this is where individual racism occurs. Um, this can range from targeted racial um, harassment and overt discrimination to subtle small events that occur on a daily day-to-day daily, daily, day -day basis. So microaggressions, um, these are subconscious and often um, um, simply occur very just randomly or recurrently, you may not even realize that you're saying one. Um, and they occur many times by in by between coworkers as jokes or uh, at work as you no know, comments, um, slight observations that you might make, com cartoons, different drawings, different things that may make itself around the workplace. Um, these can correlate and lead into the poison work that we're going to, or the poisoned work environment, which we're gonna get into later. And then macroaggressions are um, a different form of racism. They are an act of racism towards everyone of a race or gender or group. These are larger forms of racism. So while my, microaggressions might be individually targeted and might be personal, so it might be just you who have experienced it, a macroaggression is, um, attack on the entire group. So this is like spreading misinformation about the group or um, spreading hateful comments, spreading about the, not just about one individual and pointing them out, but about the entire group. Um, this is different from systemic racism, but many times correlates in because when it works as part of the system, it works against the entire group. Systemic racism works as a larger, on a larger scale, as patterns of behaviors, policy, or practices that are part of, of an organization. So they're built in and they automatically work to disadvantage um, individuals who are racialized or who are um, from a uh, marginalized group. Um, these essentially perpetuate and continue the disadvantages that individuals might be facing and keeps them in that um, that situation where they cannot face, they cannot find help or they cannot alleviate pressures that they're facing. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the definition of virtual discrimination and what exactly it is. So discrimination is the is any act or behavior, whether intentional or not, which has a negative impact on an individual or group because of membership in a group protected in the Human Rights Code. So, of course, racial discrimination applies when we are focusing or we are um, intentionally um, attacking individuals and negatively impacting them based on their race, based on their 
cultural heritage, religion, and ethnic origin also falls into that. Harassment on the grounds of race, it may also be associated with the grounds of color, ancestry, um, where the person was where a person was born, um, a person's religious belief, ethnic background, so on and so on. These can be things like racial slurs, jokes, ridicules. Um, while discrimination is the entire um, is the um, is an act that can be intentional or not, and may it can happen at any form. So it can happen at a systemic form, um, a, or on a micro form. Harassment might be a little bit more um, micro, although wider form jokes might be pushed out on a larger scale. Um, harassment might come more one on one from another coworker or um, going around the workplace presenting itself. Um, adding to that that poison work environment. Um, and then of course, harassment can lead into bullying, which involves repeated incidents of or pattern of behavior that is intended to intimidate, offend, degrade, or humiliate a, a particular person or group of people. Um, it can cause um, either physical or emotional harm and can include tactics as verbal, nonverbal, physical, and, um, and psychological abuse. Um, when we, when these situations start to escalate, um, this creates a very uh, dangerous situation for a lot of people. If you are find yourself experiencing racial discrimination that has continued to elevate in the workplace and the workplace is not taken seriously, um, and you find yourself unable to get any help that has, and you have experienced um, something that has correlated to a direct attack, like a hate crime, it, it goes beyond the jurisdiction of the Human Rights Commission. So it's important that if you just reach out to the police if that has been your experience, if you are being threatened or if your life is on the line, if you're experiencing anything that is um, essentially threatening your life or that has gone beyond just verbal attacks, um, that culture and that central notion of fear and that is physically causing you harm that is, you know, somebody um, going out of their way to target you, to uh, follow you, stalk you, things like that. Um, make sure you are reporting that to the police. They go beyond the jurisdiction of the Human Rights Council, so you need to take this up more, a little bit more seriously and make sure you're documenting, of course, and getting the help, proper help and support that you need. Um, just to address the poison work environment, um, and to really define what it is, a poison work environment on the basis of race is a form of indirect racial harassment or discrimination. This can look like offensive cartoons, insults, jokes, or even um, things like um, an email, email chain going out, different memes, uh, photos, videos, again, different things that might not directly be targeted at a, race, at a, at a racialized group, but can still poison the work environment and create that, that culture of um, racialization, of um, not, of unprogress, of pretty much in acceptance and inclusivity, where places should be inclusive, positive, and respectful. So it's, you have that, that right to be um, free from harassment and free from violence in the workplace, because we know these effects are have large effects on everybody, not just you, but also the workplace itself and business. Um, when we are allowing workplaces to make room for racist marks and to let racism slide, we're allowing that notion and we're saying that, okay, to those um, who you're inviting in, your clients, your customers, and you're creating that, that very exclusive and um, unproductive culture. When workplace contain racist jokes, behavior can create a poison work environment. Um, all employees have an obligation to prevent this and have the right to be free from toxic work environments, of course. So if you see something, say something. We're going to get a little into more of that later, what it means to be an ally and how you can be proactive about um, working for anti-racism in the workplace. And then Applying the code one more time here, which is special programs. Accommodation means making special agreements for some people so that they can have the same opportunities as everybody else. For example, removing their barriers for marginalized groups. Um, 
supported by the Ontario Human Rights Code is um, certain measures to, to pretty much permit and to allow the, um, the protection of certain programs in certain um, areas for, for certain groups so that way they're able to get that platform and they're able to get that opportunity to accelerate and to gain the same accessibilities as um, others in society. This, for example, addresses the situation in which um, a Black um, uh, elderly disabled individual who is more likely to face discrimination and face anti-hiring example, um, face anti-hiring um, discrimination or not able to get those promotion promotions that they need, they're able to get those a certain program that they're able to get special educations or a special op employment opportunity or um, specialized hiring programs. So that way individuals are given that opportunity to, you know, um, to uplift themselves to um, get, gain the same accessibility as everybody else, um, race based special programs attempt to place racialized persons on the same footing as those who have not experienced an historical disadvantage because of their perceived race. So it, this is important from the Ontario Human Rights Council because it attempts to address that systemically and to work to um, work against what is built into our system. Um, going into some what anti-racism policies in the workplace might look like. This is a general guidance given from the Ontario Human Rights Council. So a comprehensive anti-racism vision statement um, and policy. So this is um, a general, so sorry, these are general guidelines of what a solid organization anti-racism program will contain. Um, the first one is a comprehensive anti-racism statement policy. So make sure that it's clear that this is what they stand for that it is comprehensive to everybody, that it is simple I and mean, plain language. So that way um, everybody's getting that same message that that zero tolerance policy for discrimination and um, zero tolerance for harassment. Um, they're ensuring that it's proactive, ongoing and monitoring. So that way it's not something that they just have created and leave alone, that they're, you know, have the committee they have a committee looking at that or they have individuals addressing it consistently um, annually or whatever it is that they need to do to make sure that their anti-racism policies are staying up to date and that way they are making their most they are doing the best steps to address racism in the workplace and making sure the workers are in a safe and welcoming environment. Um, it should also implement strategies, which means strategies on how to address the complaint processes or um, racist and racial discrimination in the workplace, which means what does um, by, what does anti-bias training look like? Are there new committees that should be formed? Are there new toolkits that should be um, welcomed into the workplace and things like that? And then of course evaluation, which means you should there should be information on how your complaint or your what your um, your, your complaint or procedure is going to be, um, how it's going to happen, how the process is going to happen. You should, you should be made aware, that should be made very clear throughout the policy, um, what you, who you need to talk to, how you're able to get that information and what you need to um, collect to submit your complaint. And then it should also talk about how it's going to, um, address the specific situation, of course, and to how they're going to move forward um, for from each situation that occurs with um, racism, racial discrimination in the workplace. And then we're just gonna go into what about competing human rights here? And I'm going to take it over so that uh, TT can again have a little break to uh, um, get some water down her very parched throat. So thank you for everything that you've been saying there, TT. And I, I just want to uh, stress again that that when it comes to 
uh, racial discrimination or harassment or any kind of discrimination or harassment under the Ontario Human Rights Code. It is not the intent of the person who is giving it that matters. It is the effect on the person that is receiving it. Uh, and so it doesn't matter, you know, the the um, the bro defense of like, I was only joking, dude, uh, is, is not a defense. It's not about what your intent was. It is how the information, the comments, the environment is being received by people that matters. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit here about competing human rights. So Human rights have privacy over all other laws and legislation. So uh, in Canada, our supreme piece of legislation is the Constitution Act of 1982, uh, which has embedded within it the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and all other laws and legislation are underneath that. And it's understood that anything that violates the Constitution or the Charter of Rights and uh, Freedoms is uh, a law that, that, that those would be supreme. And so, um, you know, it's very clear that if uh, a regular law competes with a human right, then the human right is going to trump the regular law. Uh, but sometimes we have competing human rights. Uh, and uh, we're pleased about this. We're, we're glad about this because competing human rights, um, none of our rights are in fact absolute. It, it is only because we have competing human rights that we are able to that we're able to have a human rights code that allows us to protect people. So for example, the right to freedom of speech. We've heard it a lot in the last little while. Um, your right to freedom of speech does not give you the right to say hurtful and harmful things about other people. Why is that? Well, because we also have the right of security of person. Right, so I have the the right to be free of harm and hurt, and we all know that words, unlike this, the 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 childish poem, "Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never harm me." We know that words can, in fact, harm us. They can create great harm for us, uh, and they can also incite physical harm for us. And so, our freedom of speech is curtailed by the freedom of security that people also have. And so we mark a line around that. And some of it we in fact call hate speech. And we in fact take that beyond the human rights tribunal. And we say, actually, if you go this far in your language that actually becomes criminal because you are in fact inciting harm to someone. You're calling for physical injury to people. Uh, or your words could be reasonably construed to be doing that, and that actually is going to become criminal. But then less than criminal is all of the kinds of words and actions that TT has been talking about all through the day or, or through the presentation. So how do we how do we reconcile what might be competing human rights? Well, the first thing that we have to do, there's a three-stage framework, and the first thing that we have to do is we have to actually determine that both of those things are in fact rights all right so in the case of you know am i allowed to say racist or sexist things in the workplace first of all do i have a right to freedom of speech and the answer is yes both in the charter of rights and in the um in the uh ontario human rights code we absolutely have the uh, right to freedom of speech. Um, so then we have to look at the other side though. Is there a right on that other side? Do I have a right to be secure in my person? And we do, right? We do have a right to be secure in our person, to be free from harm. And so, okay, so these are, these are two rights that are now competing. Um, you know, let's like take a, a, a look at a, a different example. Um, you know, I have the, uh, I, I'm saying, hey, you know, your, um, your policy, uh, I should be able to speed whenever I want, right? Like I should have the right to be able to speed, but I'm expressing myself by speeding down the highway. Um, well, speeding, the ability to express yourself by just behaving however you want, um, it doesn't meet the criteria for actual expression under the under the code under the act so it's not actually a human right um 
And then again, the consequences of speeding are potentially hitting people, having accidents, causing harm, and again, security person is a right. So first of all, we have to recognize, are the two things right? If they are both right, now we have to go to the second stage of the framework, which is reconciling the rights. We have to figure out, well, how do we balance these two things? Where do we draw the line between your right to have speech where you can say whatever you would like against the right to security of person? All right. And so we start to have discussions and reconciling that. And sometimes, as TT was talking about, um, you know, the code has evolved over time. We've had different understandings over time that have evolved. So it's an ongoing conversation. Sometimes these things are decided at tribunal or court levels. Sometimes they're issued by rulings of the tribunal. But one of the primary things that the, that the courts and the tribunals and the commissions ask themselves when they're reconciling these rights is, where is the greater harm? Where is the greater harm? And so if I don't say something racist, what's the harm there? What's the harm with... Um, having racist things said. And we can do a quick experiment here. I'm gonna think of something racist in my head right now, and I'm not gonna say it, and we'll see if any harm comes to me. I bit my lip, but it didn't really hurt, right? So no real harm came from me, but we could probably measure the harm that would happen if I actually said the racist comment. And we have all sorts of studies um, and other effects that show the harm from those kinds of comments, right? And so we can demonstrate that there's a much greater harm to both individuals and a group of people around uh, certain words, around certain expressions, around certain behaviors. And so we can, we can put those lines in place. And again, we've got two sets of lines if we're just dealing with, with um, racism and discrimination, we've got two sets of lines. We've got language that is considered to be so over the line that it becomes criminal and qualifies as hate speech under the criminal code. And then we have other behavior that we consider to simply be a violation of your human rights, which would then go to a, before a tribunal and would uh, have remedial remedies that would, that, would, that would happen, which could include financial and monetary compensation for the person who was experiencing the racism, harassment, or discrimination, uh, and might also include other remedial effects, such as um, making the employer or the person have to undergo training, uh, change their policies, those kinds of things. So after we've done the job of, of reconciling those rights and deciding where's the greater harm, where should the line be drawn, we make ultimate decisions. Those decisions get codified in the code, in uh, releases by the commissions, and that becomes the law. But again, our understanding of these things changes over time, right? If you take a look at some of what we thought was advanced thinking uh, from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, we kind of cringe at the expression of some of that at, in today's age because we've, we've realized that there was still a lot of, of white European lens that was being applied to those understandings, that we really weren't achieving great equality. Uh, and so that is how we deal with competing human rights. Back over to you, TT. TT, I don't know if it's just me, but I am, your volume seems to have dropped way down. I don't know if there's an adjustment that you can make on your microphone at all. No, I'm not hearing you at the moment, I'm afraid. Oh, oh, that's better. Pull it without the rest of the microphone now. All right. Um, be a little bit. I, I just can't hear you as well, but that is okay because I'll be talking. So that's fine. All right. Thank you. So we'll go on to documenting everything and pretty much next steps into, you know, if you want to submit a claim or, you know, what might your next steps look like. First, it's important that whatever you're choosing to do is that you document everything. 
um, whether you're dealing with this internally or going to submit a claim, it's important that you stop first and just um, speak with someone in, in, in a supervisor or management position. Management must deal with all workplace complaints seriously. So there must be that process that we were talking about before that they have to go through. And then they must, um, you must be made aware of the results, what's going on. And of course, nobody who was directly involved in the incident should be involved in if there's uh, the investigation process. And if you want to submit that claim, then you know, continue to document your information and take it up more, um, with the Ontario Human Rights Council or um, reach out to us and we can, of course, support you in which ways that we can through that process as well. Um, through your documentation, you know, keep track of things like your contract schedule, um, Daisy Works, um, any communications between you and the management, um, pay stubs, uh, any kind of previous complaints that you may have um, put forward, anything like that. Keep track of it and keep notes of these things. If there is anybody who is a witness, if you have an ally, um, you know, some that you can trust, some that you can confide in, definitely allow them to support you. Um, you know, they are easily there, definitely someone who can come in handy later on, who can be there for you as a um, witness, as a um, eyewitness to your testimony of whatever occurred. So, you know, if there's someone that you can lean on or ask for support who is available in the workplace and that you trust, share your story, reach out so that way you're not going through this alone. Um, and of course, yeah, continue to document everything. And if you want to go forward with the claim, we'll go into what that might look like. But of course, for those who, you know, the first thing, the most important thing is to prioritize yourself. Um, if you're immediately going through this and it's a toxic work environment, it's just a bad area to be in, then leaving the workplace might be the best option. Um, there are different leaves available. Stress leave is available, which is you do have three um, unpaid protected days. This is required to, to be given or as a required accommodation if it's related to um, a human rights ground or racial, race, racial discrimination in the workplace or racial discrimination or racism in the workplace, sorry, um, which means they're required to accommodate you with three days. So um, regardless of it being, um, without being a choice, you are still given that as a, a required accommodation if you're experiencing these situations at work. Um, your contract might be able to work it out in which you will be paid for those days. Typically, if you're taking time off that are accommodated as a result of racial discrimination at work, you're going to be accommodated. Um, but again, make sure you're working that out with your workplace and making sure you're just they're letting you know the details of you know your stress leave and you're communicating that before you leave or um, whatever documents that you need to sign so that way you can take your time off or you might want to leave the workplace permanently. This might also be considered a constructive dismissal. This can be a very tricky process. So before you, you know, go through with constructive dismissal and see this as an option, it's important that you just reach out. Um, we're able to give you certain support and um, information, but of course our uh, options are limited. So, you know, if you, it's important to reach out for legal advice on your own so that way you are made aware of any specific situations that might pop up if you have any specific outlines in your contract but you could be entitled to termination pay as if you were wrongfully fired and this is called constructive dismissal um, where you're forced to leave because your workplace is pretty much refusing to do anything and they're not taking your results seriously and of course that workplace is continuously to be very toxic and unproductive um, you have to leave in order to um, claim constructive dismissal. So it's important that if you, if this is something that you're thinking about, just reach out, um, get all the information that you can before doing this and before you end up leaving your job. So, um, you know, you are able to get the next options ahead before that's your situation, if that is a choice for you. And of course, you can still submit a claim if you so choose um, and get help. Um, anybody can submit a claim with the Ministry of Labor or the Human Rights Tribunal. Of course, if this is a racial discrimination grounds, it's going to go with a under the Human Rights Tribunal. Um, we're able to help. Um, we can connect you with legal representation. We can also um, give you supports. Um, there are 
else, other free supports that are out there that are legal supports. There are legal supports to the Ontario Human Rights Council. Um, and then there are different areas like just just um, steps to justice. We are going to link some in the group chat, of course. Um, but these are just a few of the um, options so that way you can um, gain all the information before you before you can file your claim. You also have up to two years to file for unpaid wages and then human rights tribunal claims must be filed within a year. The same thing goes if you're going with if you choose to deal with this privately and you do not want to go um, deal with the human rights tribunal, you can, of course, you know, get your legal help and deal with this in small claims court. Of course, that might be a little bit more expensive due to legal fees, but you might get an entitlement or compensation of more um, or whatever it is that you're looking for. Um, you, it is still only one year in um, Supreme Court, so you still have that same amount of time. But the action that might be taken or the corrective um, remedy for you can look like anything from training policies being changed um, to suspensions, people being fired, um, to making sure our suspension without pay to um, proper um, repercussions can be taken. Um, of course, these are civil remedies and not criminal um, um, criminal remedies. So, of course, if you are experiencing a situation where it's a lot more, you're looking for a lot, um, a, a criminal charge, or you're experiencing, you know, direct physical violence and harassment, then you would want to reach out to the police, deal with that in the um, privately with small claims court, um, and go through that process with the police. Um, but when you're doing a human rights claim or anything that's dealt with Ministry of Labor, um, your compensation or your corrective action can even be an apology or funds or, you know, different things, getting your job back, whatever it might be that gets you to a position which you're able to move on. Um, and then, of course, it's important that we continue to advocate for anti-racism at work and to become an ally um, through advocating as well. So ask about cultural bias training programs that are available. Um, ask if you know the workplace can start taking those on. Management can take those on. Um, if there are any that are free for workers, or if there are any in the area, if you're a small organization, then you can definitely reach out to like us. We have many different workplaces, um, many different webinars and workshops. There are many different connections that we can have get you guys connected to to share similar um, anti-racism. Um, workshops and courses that are available, some free, some not free, that you are able to support different businesses in their um, avenue and their venture too. Um, but it's important to be proactive about advocating for healthy workplaces. Strategies are typically low cost or no cost, so it doesn't take a lot to um, form a group, to, um, to put up legal postings that are past examples of systemic remedies, um, past examples of racial discrimination that has happened and how they um, how they amended them, how they fixed them. Um, you know, talking about taking more, um, taking it more seriously about the policies if they are not annually, um, uh, sorry, if they're not regularly assessed, um, you can, argue or you can ask for your employment or your management to take more seriously to you know get on a on a council so that way you are looking over those things more regularly making sure those proper adjustments are being made and you can get directly involved in this you can also be an ally through this and um you know if you're um the individual who has either um, attributed to or even if you have not it's important just to take account take your responsibilities or take a moment to reflect on whatever the individual who is sharing their experience and sharing their um, sharing their story that they are that you're able to validate them that you are listening in that you are taking into account what they're sharing how it might how your um, implicit biases how your um, unconscious um, racist uh, racialization marks marks stereotypes stereotypes might play in to um, uh, challenge the way that you're. Um, seeing this individual or challenge, changing the way that you're seeing other people and validating their stories. So 
you know, taking responsibility and standing up for those around you. If you see something, say something, you know, um, don't allow that toxic culture or that toxic workplace to continue. So if you hearing those insults, you're hearing those jokes, if those, somebody takes you privately and says, oh, you know, this is a joke, um, but you know that somebody else wouldn't react the same and you're only being told because you might be the same color, you know, just report things like that. So that way you're creating that open workplace, that way those small little inside jokes aren't happening. The people aren't made to feel like they're something that they're being left out of like that, like they're um, purposely being made fun of in the dark. Um, situations like that, um, you know, report that, that is, you have duty to um, stand up for your rights and stand up for those around you. So if you see something, say something, validate your coworkers' experiences and, you know, allow them to confide in you, um, allow them to be there for you, um, sorry, for you to be there for them. Or if you can't, then take initiative and to um, take accountability to learn, um, take some actions to, you know, do what you can to listen, to silently support. There are many things that we can do to um, work to proactively towards anti-racism. That doesn't mean um, directly getting your hands dirty. Um, and then, yeah, we are, that brings us to our end of our, our discussion today on racism in the workplace. Um, I will give a little moment here if anybody has any questions and then they want to suggest anything that they would like to add in the group chat, please feel free. And if not, we also like to express, um, you guys can stay connected with us. Um, all of our information and all of these slides will slowly be made available onto our website. Um, soon enough so that way you'll be able to get more of this information and these the rest of these links if you missed them through here um, and you're able to stay updated and connected on workers rights if you're interested in more workshops or connecting with us one-on-one -on -one. if you've experienced real racial discrimination in the workplace and you want to get more information um, you want to pretty much just know where to start even or just want to share your story we are here to help you out, to support you along the process, or just to listen and to offer that ear. Um, a lot of the times um, it feels like nobody's listening and nobody's validating our experience. Of course, it's easy to say, you know, all these things are illegal in the workplace. You shouldn't be happening. These things shouldn't be happening. But of course, they happen all the time. Microaggressions happen all the time. Individuals are, um, you know, they experience these harsher conditions all the time, these toxic work environments all the time. So, you know, it's important just to start documenting, start taking notes. If you are, um, if you're scheduled to part time, you know, easily take notes after your schedules, after your shifts, if what how the day went. This is even just good for your own note taking, so that way you are able to account for how things happened, um, and how your days went, and just be able to easily recall all those information. I just, I don't see any uh, questions in the chat there, TT, and I just wanted to say uh, thank you to everybody for joining us. I, de I forgot to mention at the beginning of the evening that the Sudbury Workers Education and Advocacy Centre is funded by the Law Foundation of Ontario, so we thank them for their generosity that enables us to create and present these presentations. And I also wanted to uh, give a big thank you to yourself, TT, for hosting this and giving us all of this amazing information. It's really, really, um, important to get all of this and to have all of this. And so really, really appreciate you um, 